too often we're so enthralled with the gift, so overtaken by the gift, we don't even know anything about the giver. We don't even know who gave us the gift. But where does that tradition come from? The exchanging of gifts at Christmas time. You see, it's so embedded in our culture today that it almost overshadows the roots of where giving came. And that's a Christian thing. And we find it in Matthew chapter 2. Here's what I want to do this morning. I want to show you two biblical truths that are at the heart of giving from Christmas time. And then I want to show you two non-Christmas examples of giving in the Bible. So we're going to see four things this morning. The first two are two biblical truths that are at the heart of Christmas giving. And the first one is this. The Incarnation. God so loved us that He was willing to give His only Son so that we might have the penalty of sin canceled. And that opens the door for an eternal reconciliation to God. The greatest gift ever given. God is our example of the greatest gift giver. You know this passage. You learned it as a child. For God so loved the world that He, what? Gave. God gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting, eternal life. And Wade's already alluded to it this morning. You know, this is really just the beginning. That is the incarnation. That's just the beginning for us uh, of the giving of God. And I was talking to Dr. Rendell last night, and he recently preached a sermon down in Birmingham on the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> I think, what did I think of that for a sermon title? It is. The incarnation is the gift that keeps on giving it's just the beginning. And that the giving of God will never end. We will be spending an eternity in the presence of the Son and we will see God in human flesh. And as I often say, there will be nothing boring. Don't ever think that the new heaven, new earth will be boring because it won't. We will wake up every morning with a new expectation a new excitement, just like kids do on Christmas Day now. We're going to wake up with that excitement because we'll know we're going to learn something new about God today. And that will go on forever and ever and ever and ever. God will continue to be the gift giver. Look, the gift of the Son was followed by another gift. I'll give you a hint. Acts chapter 2. What was that gift? The Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 28. Peter, or 38. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gifts keep on coming. There's another one. Paul talks about grace. Grace by faith. Ephesians 2.8 For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is the gift of God. Now that's the first biblical truth. Here's the second one. The second biblical truth that teaches us how to give is the giving of the gifts of the Magi to the baby Jesus. And we read about this last night and I talked a lot about Matthew chapter 2 and all the dynamic things that are going on in this chapter and what we learn from them. Look in Matthew 2 beginning in verse 9. We'll just read part of the chapter this morning, 9 through 12. 
When they heard, that is, the wise men, the Magi, heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which had seen, they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they were, they were rejoicing with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. So here's the second example at Christmas time where we learn about giving. Over the centuries, gift giving between Christians became a way to imitate what the wise men had done. This is the root of of why we Christians give. And we can note some things about the gifts of the wise men. These gifts were generous gifts. They were sacrificial gifts. They were worthy gifts to the king. So here's the two examples at Christmas time. The incarnation stands above all as our example of why we give gifts. The second one is the, the gifts that the Magi gave to the Son of God. And they gave those gifts to express their adoration, and their honor for the Christ. Now let me give you two non-Christmas, not non-Christian, but two non-Christmas examples of giving in the New Testament. And I bet you can think of both of these. One of them involves the Apostle Paul and his missionary journeys. Go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Or, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Verse, beginning in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Paul says, For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. Do you know what they did? The churches in Macedonia heard of the needs of the church of Jerusalem. You see, the church at Jerusalem was experiencing some of the very earliest persecutions. And these early persecutions were... Jews persecuting Jewish Christians. And that persecution was causing these Jewish Christians in the Jerusalem church. Some of them were losing their businesses and their homes. And they, ha they were having to flee the city so they could survive. And they were in desperate need. They were losing their livelihoods, their way of life, because they had chosen to serve Christ to claim him as their king. It was a desperate situation. And Paul had shared the needs of the Jerusalem Christians with many of the churches in Macedonia, churches of the West, far away. And what's amazing about this story is when Paul collected these gifts from the Macedonian churches and, and got them to the churches in Jerusalem, there was one problem. And the problem was the Macedonian Christians were as poor as the Jerusalem Christians. They weren't in any better shape than the Jerusalem Christians. And yet they were willing to give. Like the little drummer boy, a classic Christmas song. 
They wanted to give, but they had very little to give, and yet they gave. And the scripture says that their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Isn't that beautiful? Their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. They had little to give, but they gave all that they could. Now that's the first example, a non-Christmas example of giving. We're taught something about how we are to give. The second one, to find the second one, we have to go back to, to another gospel. Go back to the gospel of Mark, right after Matthew. And let's look at this one. Mark chapter 12. Now here's the setting. Jesus and his disciples had gone to the temple. They were in the courts where people came, the Jews came to give offerings to the temple. There was a receptacle, like something like we have on our back wall where you could come in any time of the day and you could give offerings. That's the setting. Jesus actually is standing close to one of these receptacles. It says in verse 41, Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury and many who were rich put in much. (laughs) I always find that humorous. You know that here's uh, the Son of God who gave everything. And he's watching. Apparently he, he notices how much people are giving. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrants. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had. Her whole livelihood. Now that's a powerful lesson on giving. And from that story, Jesus is teaching us a a foundational principle about our gift giving. Jesus saw this. And he sees this widow putting in her whole livelihood. Uh, Guys, a mite was really almost a near worthless coin, Jewish coin. It's equivalent to less than our penny. I remember as a kid, I used to ride my bike all around the neighborhood and I would get into some streets that my parents, if they knew that I was riding along these busy streets, I would have probably been uh, grounded. But I had a basket on the front of my bicycle, and I would go around collecting Coke bottles. Those were the day- there were no aluminum cans in those days. You know those days when all we had was Coke bottles. And they were worth three cents apiece. And I would, I would dig them out of the mud if I had to. And I would, over a few weeks, I'd collect all these Coke bottles. I'd have them at my house and I'd clean them up and shine them up because I knew eventually my dad or mom would take me to the grocery store and I could exchange those Coke bottles. And I got three cents a bottle and it would add up. I would walk out of there eight, nine dollars rich. And you know, today, I don't know if it's if it's because I'm getting older and and the older I get, the harder it is to bend down and get up. But you know what? I, I I wouldn't stop to pick up a penny on the ground. My life depended on upon it, I don't think. Now my grandkids would. Ethan, if I showed him a penny, he would jump down and pick it up. I don't even know that I'd pick up a nickel. Now I would a quarter. Anything from a 25 cents up, I'm going to get, I'm going to bend down and pick it up. But this, uh, this lady gave about a penny into the treasury. And Jesus said that she had given her whole livelihood. 
Now, guys, he's using her to teach us about the example of true gift giving. The wealthy put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty. I don't know how many times, I mean, Carl and I have talked about this just recently. The every, even before we were married, we were faithfully giving to the church and it's just been our habit over the years to faithfully give. And, and I, I'm still old-fashioned. I, I still write a check and I bring it. I bring it to the service and I put it in that box back there. I just, I don't know, I don't think I'll ever do it another way. But some people do it online and that's okay. I'm not talking, saying anything bad about that. But I bring it and I put it in that box. But you know, as I think back over those many, many, many days where I sit down at my desk in my office at home and I open the checkbook and I write that check to Hope Community Church, how many times has the thought crossed my mind that, wow, if I just could keep this, if we were able to keep this week after week, this amount week after week after week, I wonder how wealthy we would be. How wealthy would it, we would have been by now? I'm ashamed to say I think about that sometimes. And then sometimes I, I write that check out, and you know what? I never, it's just, so, it's just so routine that I don't even think about it. I just write it out and bring it and give it. And I fail to, to realize that it's a powerful act of worship. Giving of our money all belongs to God anyway next Sunday I'm gonna share a story as we begin a new year of giving of what what some of our giving has enabled ministries to do when we've had a part of it but Jesus is teaching us here that the gifts of abundance this story, guys, is not teaching us that the gifts of abundance are not received by God. A lot of people have been blessed abundantly and they need to be giving abundantly. And God receives those gifts. He's not against large gifts. What He's teaching us here is the truth that God is looking at the heart. That's the heart He's concerned about. And parents, listen to me. This is a great way to teach your children that God wants you more than He wants anything else. And we talked about that last night. Who's sitting on the throne in our heart? God wants us more than anything else. So let me close with one or two applications. You know, in modern technology today, we can actually sit in our homes we don't even have to go to Dillard's or Bass Pro Shop or Target to buy Christmas gifts I, I saw in the news this past week where if you lived in Manhattan and you're a member of Amazon Prime and you are willing to pay seven dollars and fifty cents they guarantee they would deliver your gift within an hour and I, I told cause I asked who in the world needs a flat screen TV within an hour <laughs> but but people can do that now. I mean, you can sit in your home through technology and do all of your Christmas shopping. My point is this. You don't even have to leave your house to give what God desires. You see, you already possess the best gift you can give. And that's yourself. Giving all that you are to all that He is. We give Him our heart. Saying yes to His Lordship like we talked about last night. And there was the warning, there's a lot of little King Herods in our hearts who want to sit on the throne. But we, we give Him our heart, all of it, and say yes to His Lordship. Our hands our hands to serve people, helping others. Our talents, our abilities 
that we can use for the glory of God abilities and spiritual gifts. Everyone has them. And our love, when you love others, do you know what you're doing? When you love other people, you are proclaiming the love of Christ. And I'll say it again. I've learned this a long time ago. When it comes to the kind of love we're talking about here, it usually demands our time. It's a sacrifice. I was talking, I think it was last Sunday after church, to, to uh, Jerry, to your wife Sue. Or maybe it was a few weeks ago, I can't remember when. But we were talking about giving, and, and Sue Schaefer is so talented. She just, she's just a talented woman. She, she, she does things that, you know, I saw my grandmothers do. I didn't think anybody still did those kind of knitting things. And, but she's just a gifted lady. But on top of that, she just loves to give. And she said something, just, I, I, I thought it was so, so um, powerful. It just caught me, that, and it reminded me that it's how true this is. She said, you know what? Giving to me brings joy. It just makes me happy. And I said, how true that is. How much does God bless us when we give of ourselves in love to other people and that often requires our time. And over the years, there's something I've noticed about those who love to give, who have the gift of giving. I, I, can, I could name people, and some of you wouldn't know these people, but they have the gift of giving. And you know when I'm around them, they're joyful people. They're just joyful people. And I think that's a, that's a blessing of God because He blesses those who love to give. Let me close with this and then we'll have communion. John 13, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you. Jesus was speaking to His disciples. That you love one another as I have loved you. By this, all will know that you are my disciples. Hey, enjoy your gift giving today. And then may your realm of gift giving expand this coming year. You learn to love to give in different ways and then enjoy the blessings of God as you give. God does love a cheerful giver. Would you bow your heads with me? And We are going to offer communion again this morning because we knew that there would be some here today that weren't here tonight or last night and Wade, if you and Lance would come forward, I think the two of you could probably handle this this morning. And we want to give you an opportunity there in your seat to prepare to receive the sacrament. If you, if you partook last night, take again. There's no limitation on this. It's a celebration, a reminder that, that He is with us. We look back this morning to the Incarnation. But we also, as we consider the bread that represents the body and the juice that represents His blood, we are reminded as we look back that He gave, He gave Himself, as I said earlier, so that we could be free from the penalty of our sin. What a great gift. We also consider this morning as we take the communion we have to remember what he is presently doing in our lives God through his Holy Spirit is working out in our lives that great salvation that he initiated through the Holy Spirit's regeneration of our hearts we are now being saved we're in that battle we're learning to say no to things we're learning to yield to the Holy Spirit and to, to Christ's Lordship 
And we know through the scriptures that we will be victorious. In fact, that final battle has already been fought and won. The victory is already ours. That puts us, should put us in a great state of mind as we continue this Christian walk that often includes the battles. And then we look forward, as Wade has talked about already this morning. Jesus said that he would come again. The first time he came to bear the sins of many. The second time he will come as the king who will have the right to judge the world. Let's be thankful this morning that there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you this morning again for the elements set before us and what they teach us. And as we taste this morning, I pray that you'll speak, Holy Spirit, through, through the gate of our senses and remind us again of the wonderful gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ the greatest gift ever given. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. After they, that night in the upper room, had had their dinner, the Last Supper, the Scriptures tell us that Jesus broke the bread, and He gave it to His disciples and said, Eat from it, all of you, for this is My body. The account in Matthew 26 continues this way. It says, after they had broken bread together, Jesus took the cup. He gave it to his disciples and he said, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of our sins. Well, so many people in the world today are drinking to try to forget things. We as Christians drink from this cup to remember. Let's remember the forgiveness of sins. Amen. I you to stand and let's, we're going to close with a song today and then I'll have a final word before we go. I want to remind you that next Sunday, January the 1st, uh, our guest speaker will be Ronnie Stevens. So I hope you'll come and invite others to join with us and hear a wonderful message from our good friend Ronnie. Now, as you leave today, let me bless you with these words. To all of you who are called the beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.